So quite briefly from an LGA perspective, we're working on a few main priorities that were set by the leadership board, which Paul's a member of. Um, so if you don't like these priorities, you've got somebody you can grab hold of quite quickly. Um, the first one, and probably the obvious one, finance. Um, two, two big issues, the fair funding review and business rate retention. The fair funding review, I think, now is moving at a pace that everybody seems to be fairly content with from an LGA perspective. Certainly, Paul hasn't threatened to throttle anybody in the last two meetings, so I'm assuming it's relatively good going. I'm not sure that'll be the same when you talk to the government, though. I think their timescale for the fair funding review is further away than ours would ideally be. I think we're not looking likely that any financial benefits for fair funding will start to kick in inside 2020. That does mean in that, in that 10 year period, you guys would have lost 3.6 billion quid. It's about 60% of your spend. Um, you did notice a couple of years ago when Greg was there, we managed to get some transitional relief. That's due to run out this year. Our argument, and one that Paul's made quite forcefully and one that I've echoed as well, is that transition means you were going from somewhere to somewhere. And given that the somewhere you were going to has now been put off further away, that the transition grant needs to be carried on. So um, last week we wrote to the Chancellor and to SAGE just to try and keep that pressure on to make sure that after the budget, when we do local government spending stuff, we will get some more transitional relief. I'd be extremely disappointed if the Magic Sofa didn't yield up a big chunk of money for that. I'm not sure whether it would be as much as it was before, but they understand, I think, the pressures of where you are with that. Uh, just to put it in a little bit of context, the districts have lost a higher percentage than the counties have. I know that will go down like a lead balloon. <laughs> but it's only a billion quid compared with your 3.6. And what the districts don't have, and strangely enough, by the time of this, I will be speaking to them tomorrow at their conference and reminding them of this, they haven't got the over 600 million quid pressures that have been put on adult social care and a large number, I think it's about 800 million quid, on children's services. So you, not only have you taken the 60% cuts, you've also got another one and a half billion quid's worth of funding pressure that's been put on for demand-led services that you can't control in terms of your cost base. And that's the point that we as an LGA have been trying to really push forward, is that the money that's coming out is it's not good for anybody. Nobody wants to lose money, but somehow they have to be able to recompense you for the increased workload that's coming through. So that's probably the single biggest thing that we're working on. Uh, adult social care, you know we worked on that as a massive priority well, two years ago and last year, and we were successful with the work that you guys did in the county as well, the county network as well, bringing in two billion quid over three years for that. That was only a sticking plaster, and it was recognised by the Secretary of State, or in fact by both Secretaries of State, both Jeremy and Sage, that that was only a sticking plaster. It wasn't a permanent solution, but it was to get us through the immediate period. The trouble is that was then accompanied by a green paper on what do we do for, for real? How do we fix this problem that everybody seems to have recognised now is a problem? And again, the trouble with that is the general election didn't yield the result the government was expecting to be able to be in a position to be able to do the work necessary to get there. So that's been pushed off into the long grass. So again, we're going to be looking for another sticking plaster this year on top of the sticking plaster they put on it last year. But if we're very careful, if we're, if we're not very careful, the whole thing will just go over at some point. We're confident that the billion plus we've been saying is needed this year just to fix the broken market is a real number. Mark's told me this morning of some well-respected organisation that I'm not sure is well-respected, but it is independent, so we'll go with that, are going to come out and verify the numbers that we've been putting up. And we might have slightly over-egged it, but over a billion quid is necessary to stabilise the existing market, never mind to protect the services going forward. So I think there'll be sufficient noise in the system around adult social care to be able to get recognition for at least the pressures on the older person's part of that. But we know from the numbers you guys have been feeding into us that the real pressure isn't going to be looking after the old people. It's going to be looking after the working age people who rely on that budget spend. So, so that will then become the new priority in that area, I think. I think we'll move away from the money spent on older people across to the working age stuff, which the government could come up with a formula somehow for the, work, uh, for the older people through some sort of 
ISR or whatever, some self-funding mechanism, but you're never going to be able to bring that in for the working age people because the, the lifespan of that is just going to be too big for anybody to grapple with. So it'll be interesting to see where this latest call from AEMPs, I haven't seen their names, but respect to all eight of them, whoever they are, for saying we need to deal with this on a cross-party basis. You'll know the LGA made that offer to government and to the main opposition parties a few months ago. With the exception of the minor opposition party, the two main parties refused out of hand. So both Conservatives and Labour have got no interest in trying to talk to the LGA and all of its members to come up with a sector-led proposal. But we'll see what happens when the, the pressure of these eight EMPs. If there's enough blue ones in that list, that might put a bit more pressure on. Uh, one subject that is also on our priority list that you won't be bothered about, but you should be, is housing. If your conversations today about a brave new world and reorganisation and all the rest of it, which I don't really want to get into for varying reasons, but if you go there in questions, I won't shy away from them. But if you are serious about going into that space, some of you are going to have to start stepping up to become strategic housing people as well. You're, you're going to have to broaden your offer into that one subject area particularly, given that the government has said it's their main priority. Certainly the Prime Minister's got her fingerprints all over it now. I, I have never seen in my political life a Prime Minister make a a platform speech and put council housing in such a positive light. If that's going to become a reality and you do aspire to become the strategic housing leads in an area, you're going to have to get your head around what does council housing mean for us? And I think that's a space that the LGA will be able to help through if, if anybody does want to start branching out and, and figuring out how does this housing offer start to impact on county services, we'd be more than happy to work there. And obviously the the last area of our main priority is probably which is the biggest spend, children's services. That's, that's going to be new, the new adult social care as far as the LGA is concerned in terms of our major campaign. So we'll be starting to put together a coalition of respected independent voices around that story because adult, uh, adult social care is one that you can get traction around and the government like it in terms of the people you're talking about are voters. The tr trouble with children's services, they're not voters. So they don't, in my experience, have the same political imperative with a government story. But if we don't start to get to grips with that, we're going to be well out. Most of you have overspent again this year on your children's services budgets. And it's not because you're no good at it. It's because the problem is getting bigger and bigger. I was with the North East leaders on Friday up in Durham. Simon, thank you very much for your hospitality. Really ple pleasant to be up there. And thank you for letting me go and see your lights in the evening. Can you turn the temperature up a little bit, though? Because us softies from down south don't like it quite so cold. Um, yeah, the, the, the pressure on children's services is just completely off the scale up, up north. They're the worst area for the spend, but it's not just a, a unique thing. Even in the city of London, where you would say that deprivation and poverty and all the rest of it are not issues, children looked after children are going up at a rapid rate there as well. <laughs> So those are the main priorities that we're working on. I hope they're the ones you want us to be working on. Um, if, if not, then you need to be telling people like Paul, who bends our ear quite a lot when he sits around the leadership table. Although him and Peter are playing quite nicely at the moment, which is pleasant to see. Not very often that happens. But if they're not the right things, let Paul know, let me know. And I'm going to shut up now because I have to get off in a couple of minutes. Um, you've got some adults coming on after me, apparently. <laughs> Um, but I'm happy to take questions, comments, duck any of those stress balls that you were given to throw, whatever. For questions and comments, so uh, the microphones are out and about. Can I see a few hands, those that might like to ask Gary? Any questions, comments? Well, well while we're waiting, can I ask you a question, <laughs> Gary, if I may? Uh, on, on the fair funding review, you talked about nothing happening till 2020-21. Uh, the uh, essential need to have bottomed out the fair funding review and what good looks like is absolutely essential. Otherwise, we're only going to superimpose business rate retention on top of a massively unfair and flawed model. Um, and uh, there's concern, I know, amongst colleagues uh, that the no detriment clause to any authority, which is currently, I think, the LGA's position, is very worrying uh, to uh, our members because we really do believe that we need real equity and fairness uh, imposed into the new funding methodology to baseline what every local authority needs to have a fair chance of delivering. Yeah, I don't think I'd, I would disagree with you. I mean, 
on the basis that we need to understand what would be a reasonable unit cost per child, per adult, per empty in the dustbin, whatever, we do need to get to that, that place. We do need to understand as a sector where we can get that agreement. And it should be possible, because that will all be empirical, to agree what would a fair unit cost for a thing look like. It's the then, what else do you put in there? Do you, do you model in the ability to raise council tax? Well, for this, and this is personal, this isn't an LGA perspective, so don't say the LJ thinks it, but it's in my thinking on it. If you've got somewhere where all of their houses are band A, band B, their ability really to raise a lot of council tax is pretty limited compared with a place that's got a range of properties from A to off the Richter scale. So the ability to raise more is different. But some of those places with lots of higher band properties have chosen historically to not put up their council tax. So places like Wandsworth, and I can say that because they're not in membership of the LGA, have got a very low council tax per head of population despite having a better demographic of population compared with a place like mine in Lincolnshire. So where Martin and I look after in Lincolnshire, South Holland, I've got mainly band A and band B properties. There's not much beyond that. But we're still hammering somebody from a band A property twice what a band D is in Wandsworth. Yeah. And that can't be built into a new model, or at least if it is, then you're not reasonably going to be able to call that fair. And, but that's the trouble the LGA's got, because some of our members have a very low tax raising threshold, some have a very high car parking mm -hmm. threshold, and it's where do all of those other numbers play in. And that's the bit that the LGA's going to have to grapple with, and I think that that's the point that we, we will struggle, because I can't see you all agreeing. I mean, I've sat in this room, well, not this room, one in Surrey somewhere, I think it was, where not all of the county leaders agreed what fair looked like, but I think there's an agreement from everybody that a unit cost fairness must be able to be reached. It's then how do you apply that with the other criteria? And that's the bit where I think the struggle will be. But I think the sector probably will get there. I mean, there's 13 billion quid extra of rates on the table in terms of what we actually collect compared with what the Treasury let us keep. So if we were able to keep all of that and use that to equalise it at least a chunk of the way, we might not get to total fairness, but we would be 13 billion quid out of a total of 20 billion quid to get there. So we would be two thirds of the way there to look what, you know, what fair looked like then. But then you've got your other argument about reorganisation and now will that then play in beyond that point? Because even though it might not be happening in the life of this parliament, at some par parliament, reorganisation is bound to rear its head as a serious proposition just because it's an option. I'm not favouring it particularly, or speaking against it, but it is going to be an option that governments will look at. Yeah, I mean, I think all we're asking for is that the LGA plays it with a straight bat based on uh, the evidence that is submitted and the alternative models that get as close to fairness as possible. And if the LGA tries to fudge it, there'll be big problems. I, I would hope by your experiences sitting around the table at some of our meetings, you know we're not trying to fudge it. You know okay. when some people didn't want the Leicestershire model put in on the table, mm -hmm. that we were insistent that it should be on the table. I, I, as chairman, I won't, well, you all know me by now, I don't duck anything. I might not give you the answer you want to hear, but I won't, I won't deliberately lie, and I definitely won't duck a question. I, I don't mind getting to the wrong place, but I'll do it head on. Now, I'm not seeing a sea of hands desperate to... Ah, there's one over here, and Jane. And please Hello. say who you are. It's about housing. Uh, where are we with the uh, local councils being able to borrow um, for local, um, what was used to be council housing? But I don't think it should be used to be council housing. It still is council housing, and this country, since 1948 planning, has only ever hit 300,000 units a year a couple of times, and that were both when the state built 40% of the provision. If the Chancellor is serious, and he's reiterated it again in the press over the weekend, that he wants to be the Chancellor that builds 300,000 units a year, he will only do that, and I, I will have a tenor with anybody on this who wants to have a, a bet with me, he will only be able to do that if he lets Council start building again. And the only thing stopping us from building again is access to our money. And I mean our money, I don't mean his money. We own over a million housing units as councils, and all I'm suggesting is that we be able to borrow against the value of the existing stock to put up replacement stock. We've worked the numbers through. We can deliver half a million units in the life of a parliament. 
and that means we won't have to waste 24 billion a year on housing benefit, which is what we are doing at the moment. We're spending nine billion quid a year on building houses and 24 billion quid a year on keeping people in substandard accommodation quite often. It doesn't make economic sense. The Treasury, and no disrespect to anybody who's a civil servant or got a child who's a civil servant or a parent who's a civil servant, the Treasury is full of financial pygmies in terms of the people who work in there. They know the cost of everything and the value of nothing. Jane. Uh, can I, on the back of the answer you gave on fair funding to Paul, um, I think this is a big issue for the Local Government Association. Um, it's how they stop being all things to all people and start to take real evidence and then go on and, and uh, work on behalf of the whole of local government. It, it doesn't matter which part of it you are. And I think he's finding that very difficult. And you wouldn't expect me not to mention reorganisation because we probably talk about it every day. But the, the issue for me is exactly the same on that. It's about the LGA taking the real evidence, and there's a lot of it now. If you haven't got enough, there's another report that's come out today from this public, and that you can have that as well. And it's, it's about taking that evidence and doing what's right for the local government family so it can have a proper relationship with government and not this one where I think they think that because we're fighting among ourselves that they don't need to talk to us properly at all. I kind of agree with you to some extent on that, Jane. Um, the, the why we're fighting with ourselves, they won't take us seriously, is always the way government works. The government would love, and not just this one, previous, its predecessor and its predecessor, would love us to split away into factions again. Because as soon as we stop speaking with one voice, they're free to ignore any voice that they disagree with. So it is important that we speak with one voice. And I, I do agree, the LGA has been too quick to go to lowest common den denominator to get agreement. But to a certain extent, that's the trouble of being a membership organisation. The, the people who are much cleverer than me, or you know, even, dare I say it, Mark, the chief executive, who, who were in our places donkeys years ago when the LGA was first set up, realised that. That's why they created the district councils network, the county councils network, Sagoma for the Mets to allow a strong voice. The trick for us is to try and harness those individual sectoral voices to bring together as, as one common voice. We can't always do that, and it would be wrong to always do it. I can't always get agreement sitting around my dinner table at home. But I do know when I have to back down. Normally when it's passed past my wife, my children, and my dog, then I'm allowed to have my own opinion. But that's kind of where we are a bit in the LGA. We, we, we have to be able to keep people together. And if, if people think we take one group side more than the other, that then will make people genuinely move away. I still think we offer massive value for money in terms of an organisation. We're working on some whizzy thing with trucks now. Apparently we've all been mugged over by people who make trucks. Great. How much is that worth then? Upwards of a million quid for some councils, that's worth. That makes the LGA membership look pretty reasonable value to me. I hasten to add I'm a district councillor and I probably won't get any money off the trucks mugging over because we only have half a dozen dust carts. But I don't do fire engines or gritters or all the rest of it. So some counties will do really well out of that if we're successful. You know we've got the credit card scam thing going on. That will bring money back. All of the other bits we do add that value in. Um, I'd be lying if I said I'm always going to agree with my county colleagues. Martin knows that's not the case. Martin will know most often we do agree with each other on most things. But not always. There, are, there will always be things that drive us up into different directions, which is why it's important that you know, Paul's got a strong voice in the counties. If Paul doesn't shut up when we do Wednesday meetings, even though I can't tell you what happens in the Wednesday meetings, he doesn't shut up going on about a county case. John does my head in. John Fuller now is starting to do the same thing for districts. So that, well, not as bad as Paul, admittedly. John, John, <laughs> John's still finding his feet, but good luck if he ever finds them. But, but that's what happens. Those groups, they are the real voice. We're the collective umbrella that brings it all together. And on reorganisation, I love you at the bits, Jane, but you're wrong. <laughs> well, right. you're not wrong. If, if I was given a map, I wouldn't create the current system. Right. I don't think any of us in this room would draw the lines how we've got doing the things we do. Because most of the public we look after still think it's our fault, whatever it is. It's the council. You're it. I can't blame Martin. He can't blame me. It's you. You're the council. So some sort of reorganisation will have to come, particularly if it's a world with no money. 
but you do know what I said last year to you and to the districts, it is mutually assured destruction if, if we go down that route. I, I can see very few boundaries being drawn again where they currently are because unless you're a Norman, most of the boundaries where they are now don't make sense. You know, you can find that the health economy doesn't work, the housing economy doesn't work, the economy economy doesn't work around some lines. And that's the argument that needs to be taken through to where we go in the future. This is flashing now. I've got dance music coming on. Right, it's we not have my fault. One more question, Gary, if we may, at I the know. back. Is it Philip? Okay. Um, Philip yeah. Long, um... It's your fault. <laughs> <laughs> Brave man for saying that. Most things are. Um, no, I, I, I really appreciate the honesty that you said earlier that uh, going to be outside just now that we started organising England. We wouldn't do it like this. It's a mess on multiple levels, multiple uh, different forms of government, different forms of authority. But what's the optimal here? Well, how do we even achieve the levels of devolution that can give us the gains that, you know, numerous studies that can all report today without reorganisation? Could be well above my pay grade. I, I, I can tell you all the things that are wrong with the current system. I haven't seen anywhere a system that I would swap it for. And that's the trouble. It, we've got a health economy that doesn't work around our existing local government boundaries. That's why we're getting so much grief of detox figures. If we had a, a decent working relationship with areas of the same boundary and political control over those organisations, we wouldn't be having the row over detox. The priority for health would be stopping people going into hospital in the first place, not getting them out when they're broken. And it's because we don't control the health and because nobody democratically controls it, and I mean nobody at any level, but particularly at a local level, there is no democratic control. There is no need for those services to improve from a customer perspective because it's a fixed market. You can't go anywhere else. If, you know, if you're broken, very few people can afford to go to see a different GP or a different hospital. It's the same around economic development. I live in Lincolnshire. I love living in Lincolnshire. I love getting back to Crowland and getting back into my patch. But all the people who work in my area tend to work to Peterborough in Cambridgeshire. So a kind of an administrative boundary around Lincolnshire doesn't work for housing and employment to the south. And it's that. It's finding where does a line on the map really make sense from the punter's point of view. And then there's another argument, does it really bloody matter? So long as the services get delivered, does it actually matter where the line on the map is? Do any, do any punter really care? Does anybody really bother about where they live, providing where they live they feel safe, secure, and their children have got a good future? That's, for me, is the driver for it. I thought that's why most of us got into politics, was to try and make the world a bit better. I haven't come into it to have a row over where a line on a map should be. It's about what's the service outcome for the people we're supposed to be looking after. That's the bit that bothers me. So I, if you're looking for me to be able to draw you the line on the map, I'm not that person. Because I'll draw you a different line on a Monday to what I'll draw you on a Wednesday because I am a bit schizophrenic for thinking about things like that. Mm. But we are where we are and we believe strongly that the co-terminosity of public services around uh, county boundaries and joining together of counties in some cases through mutual uh, agreement is the right way forward but you know we talked about it this morning yeah. uh, the uh, hodgepodge of uh, broken boundaries for health for laps for yeah. everything else under the sun has not been good for strong strategic leadership across this country outside of the cities and that's what we're pitching and, and I don't think you'd get disagreement from any sensible politician no matter what level of council they were from if a district leader said actually it's better for my people that my health economy and my county economy are run by two different things then they're not very good district leaders because that's not the best thing from the punter's perspective. Having it all sitting in one boundary, whatever the boundary is, is the place. And having one group of people to be accountable for it 
does make sense, because when you're accountable in the ballot box, you're much more likely to see it from their point of view than you are from the organisation's point of view that you're part of. Very good. So. Gary, we've run out of time. Thank you enormously for coming up to uh, speak to us today. We're enormously grateful for your uh, openness, honesty and candor. <laughs>